Hello everyone and welcome to The Plain Bagel. We are doing another question and answer video. It's been a while since we did our last one, uh, mainly because Noah left me and I didn't really have anyone to co-host the videos. Uh, but now I have my friend, my good friend Craig Lord, who will be filming these uh, with me in the future. He's actually helped me film a few episodes. He's someone who works in the Ottawa area as a journalist. So Craig's gonna be helping me film these uh, moving forward. Uh, really thankful to him that I don't have to pay him for his help. Uh, what? So in the question and answer videos, we take questions from the YouTube comments section and we answer them. It's a chance to cover topics that we don't want to commit a whole video to, uh, but that people are still curious about. If you have any questions in the future, leave a comment down below and we will do our best to get to them. So without further ado, first question. X325 asks, would you talk about the way Canada taxes traders? By trader, I mean people who trade in the few weeks to a few month time frame. In Canada, there's actually no such uh, differentiation between short-term and long-term capital gains. So if you're trading within weeks and months, you're not going to see any issue there. You're still going to have a capital gains tax as if you had held that position for three years or five years. Um, I know there are some rules on day trading taxes, which I don't know the details about. Uh, but again, that's if you're buying and selling within the same day. So if your time frame is a few weeks and a few months, Typically, uh, you know, as with all other capital gains, you'll pay 50% of your marginal tax rate on the gains that you've made on your positions, just like you would with a five-year position. The next two are from the synthetic stock video. Shamanzo asks, how long do you hold this synthetic stock? Seems like short term. Yeah, so uh, I should have mentioned this in the video. Synthetic stocks only last for the duration of the options. So because options are, uh, you know, three months, six months, sometimes a year uh, in length, once that time passes, the option no longer exists. It's either exercised or it's expired. Um, so that's a key differentiation because obviously a stock doesn't expire unless the company, you know, goes bankrupt. But again, like I mentioned in the video, the reason why people make these synthetic stocks is for arbitrage opportunity. Uh, if you have your synthetic stock and your normal stock and one's cheaper and one's more expensive, then you can buy the cheap one and, and sell the expensive one. It's an opportunity to kind of lock in a profit that way. Um, but yes, it's it. you don't have this synthetic stock for a long period of time. Megan Keegan asks, isn't this what happened back in 2008? It's the same idea, uh, but different instruments. So a synthetic stock, like we mentioned, uses options. And the idea is that you're basically betting on a stock's performance without owning the stock. In 2008, we had kind of a similar setup, but people were instead betting on mortgage payments. So you had this arrangement where people were buying houses on mortgages and making payments to their mortgages. Um, and there are people on the side basically putting side bets on whether that person will default or not. So long answer short, it's the same idea, but different securities. Uh, both involve uh, having investors doing side bets on an investment or transaction that they aren't originally a part of. Medhat Ali asks, would you please explain duration and convexity? Ooh, those are complex topics. The technical definition of duration is the weighted average time for which payments of a fixed income investment are paid. Um, but you don't really need to understand that complex definition. You just need to know that duration measures a fixed income instrument's price sensitivity to interest rate changes. What I mean there is that interest rates have a negative correlation to a bond's price. Um, as interest rates go up, bond prices typically go down. Duration measures the sensitivity at which bond prices go down when interest rates go up. So let's say you have two bonds, interest rates go up, bond A moves, uh, loses a lot of money in its price, and bond B barely moves. Uh, generally speaking, ignoring everything else, bond A would have a higher duration than bond B uh, because it saw its price drop by a larger amount than bond B. Convexity, uh, you're going another layer deeper. Uh, convexity measures a bond's duration's sensitivity to interest rate changes. What I mean there is that uh, in our example where bond A dropped by a lot, let's say interest rates go up again by the same amount. Um, and bond A's price might not go down by the same amount. What we're saying is that its duration changes with interest rates. So convexity measures the sensitivity of duration 
to the changes in interest rates. Like I said, it's a very complex topic and probably one that's hard to illustrate with hand movements. Uh, maybe I'll do another video kind of trying to explain it, but to summarize, duration measures a uh, bond's volatility uh, or sensitivity to interest rate changes. Convexity measures a bond's duration's sensitivity to interest rate changes. Does that make sense, Craig? I wasn't listening. Vexray asks... Wait. I think that's Vexrap. Oh. Yeah, it's Vexrap. It is. I mean, Vexray is a better name. I'm sorry, Vexray. Vexrab asks, why do non-voting, non-dividend shares hold value? So this kind of touches on a topic I've never really discussed before, which is the difference between non-voting and voting shares. Voting shares are more traditional in nature. Uh, you know, when you have a voting share, you get a vote on certain corporate decisions, uh, appointments to the board of directors, uh, different corporate decisions like that. A non-voting share strips that out, so you don't get a say in certain management topics. Now, the reason why those still have value is because even though you don't have control, inherent control over the company in terms of decision making, you still have ownership of its assets. You still have claim to their profits that are being generated and reinvested into the company. Over time, if the company grows in value, your percentage claim over its assets should also grow in value. Um, so that's kind of the long answer short is, you know, even though you don't get explicit control over the company, you still have ownership of its assets and that's what has value here. And that's all the questions we have. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you have questions in the future, make sure to leave me a comment and I will do the research and try to get back to you. For The Plain Bagel, my name is Richard Coffin. Thanks for joining me.